it's Talking Leadership again, and I'm being joined today by uh, John Black. How are you, John? Good, thank you, Eric. Thank you. Look, um, thank you for joining us, mate. And by way of introduction um, and putting all things on the table, I've known John for a long time. I worked, I had the pleasure of working for him in my younger days. Geez, I'm not that old, but in my younger days with uh, the Council of Mayors in Careful. Brisbane. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not having a go at you, John. Um, no. I, 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 I count John amongst the few in my career that I saw as one of the best leaders I've ever worked for, let alone CEOs that I've worked for. And uh, I tried for quite some time to track John down to do this podcast with me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation because John's background is uh, has had he's had experience in the military. Um, he's a former CEO of lots of organisations in the in the utility space, in the in the government sphere of things, and he's also ex uh, TAFE New South Wales. So, John brings a very large suite of uh, leadership experience to the discussion, and so I'm going to welcome you again, John, and ask you the following question to cast your mind back to. When was the first um, official leadership role you took and why did you take it on? <laughs> well, this uh, probably concerned you a bit, Eric. My, my first official leadership role was uh, I was a shift leader at a uh, petrol retailer. Uh, okay, petrol excellent, petrol. excellent. Ampol, yeah. So many okay. years ago, I was 17 years old. Right, so you started young. Um <laughs> okay, so um, in, in moving, oh, excellent. Okay, so in in moving on, when you got through um, your high school years and you went to your your, your first formal job out of high school, um, what what was that? What industry was that in, John? Oh, uh, defence. I was uh, army officer, commissioned army officer. So that was my first, as you uh, convey, Eric. I guess my first uh, career job um, outside of school. Yeah. So okay, leadership, um, leadership role in the army. Yeah. Okay. What 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 drew you to that as a one as a career pathway and to um, the officer side of things? What what was what was what drew you to that, John? Well, this is where it gets difficult, doesn't it? Because you're thinking back. In my case, uh, nearly forty years. Um, but I do recall. <laughs> yeah, I do recall at the time. Um, and I mentioned I was doing, uh, well, running a shift at a, a petrol station. I do remember the owner of the petrol station was a former army officer. Uh, the, uh, I beg your pardon, he was a Korean War uh, a veteran. And um, I guess it sparked my interest. And by virtue of being in Canberra at the time, also uh, there was quite a lot of uh, access to the, the military, I suppose, uh, through that that job and through my school. So I also saw the opportunity of a scholarship, which meant I could get a university education um, funded by uh, the military, uh, which I was fortunate enough to win. So that gave me a pathway into University of New South Wales, uh, Royal Military College, and then obviously commission into the army, so that was the the pathway I followed. Um, if you ask me if if I did that because I wanted to be a leader, I'd have to say no. I mean, I did not fully appreciate um, what it meant. Um, obviously, I knew the difference between being an officer and a soldier, um, but I hadn't really, at that time of entry, understood what it actually meant, and that came through. Uh, that education experience that I had leading up to my commissioning. Okay, excellent. Uh, so in, in your travels, John, um, what what do you see the difference, if any, between uh, leadership in an organisation and management in an organisation? Well, look, I, I, I see quite a difference, actually. I'm, I'm probably a little bit stark uh, compared with others um, in a simplistic sense, and I think it's a bit jargonistic, but it it's an easy way to understand it, is that um, you lead people and you manage resources. Now, some people will say, well, people are resources. Well, I, I, I like to differentiate those two. 
And further breaking that down it, with respect to people, uh, it is not so much about their intellect, it's about their character. And uh, when it comes to managing resources, uh, it is around competence with tools where you get a lot of the intellectual component come in. So I think that's where I stand on that and therefore I see quite a distinction between the two. Um, and I think throughout my working life, uh, particularly observing uh, leaders as we all do, uh, regardless of what role you're in, you, you, you do look at that and reflect on it. And that's the way I, I, I think, um, you know, leadership to me is about character. Okay, great. Uh, so here's 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 one that um, I'm very interested in is leaders sometimes make mistakes. How do you engage with an error or mistake you've made that's attributed to you? Wow. Well, I think, Eric, the first thing is that uh, you know, mistakes should happen if a leader is uh, doing his or her job uh, because ultimately it rests around decisions. And I'll be very surprised, very surprised if any listener has never been in a situation where a mistake hasn't been made. I mean, there are many roles and jobs where uh, we can't afford to make mistakes and we know where that leads in with respect to safety and, and so forth, but we all know they do happen. Um, a mistake usually comes from uh, a decision, which then is linked back to ultimately the leader Although the mistake may have been attributable to a member of the team, uh, ultimately it comes back to the leader's decision. So therefore, in my view, um, it's important for that leader to be accountable uh, for that decision. And in that sense, then, you don't uh, try to hide it or cover it or do anything like that. It's best to be far more uh, open, in my view, uh, and admit to the mistake. And then the important thing is to learn from that. Um, and uh, I, I guess, again, it's probably seen as obvious, but you, know, you don't make the same mistake twice. Um, I just remember, Eric, there's a time um, going back for 30 years, I suppose. I just remember, you know, the frenzy by media because a Royal Australian Navy ship had... Uh, basically barreled into and damaged the wharf in Darwin. Anyway, the, the feeding frenzy of cameras and journalists was there as the captain of the ship alighted, came ashore to face the music, and he just looked at the camera and said, I made a mistake. And, of course, it, the no story. Um, and that, to me, epitomises why it's important that you just uh, make mistakes, learn from them and move on. Uh, but we've got to make sure we don't develop a culture of not allowing mistakes to happen, otherwise your leaders will not develop. Um, you've got to be able to trust people to do things and allow them to make mistakes. Uh, as I said previously, obviously you, you temper that with uh, your risk assessments you have to do. And if you're doing a job like uh, I was in the military, as you, if you've alluded to, um, there's certain times when you don't want a mistake to be made and you've obviously got more controls. But Boy, oh boy, we've got to make sure we, we uh, you know, ensure we develop an environment, a working environment where we can make mistakes. Yeah, great. John, um, what in your estimation is the most difficult part of being a leader? Um, I think uh, my experience would tell me that the most difficult period is when you have to make hard decisions. Uh, and in my case, uh, I find it difficult when you know that the outcomes of that are significantly impacting people, um, whether it's losing their job, um, whether it's changing their job, or whether it's changing the nature of, of, of people's work and affecting their life, their livelihood, or, or relations. So in my view, that's probably I found the most difficult for me. Um, I think um, I reflect on that from going from my military time when you're putting people into harm's way, but you also, every job I've done, you know, whether it's a water utility, 
uh, a government department or, or indeed TAFE in New South Wales is that by virtue of the type of work, you're always putting people in danger, driving between point A and point B. Uh, and those are the difficult things. But the leader, in my view, has to ensure that the team is appropriately trained, they're prepared, and the risks are appropriately mitigated. And then ultimately that work environment is as safe as it can be. But as going back to your first question, that's the toughest thing I find being a leader, sometimes when you have to make hard decisions. But uh, I've also learned don't delay those decisions. Yeah, okay. So um, as a follow-on to that, what, what, um, how do you measure success as a leader, John? Oh, <laughs> um, for me, there's a couple of indicators that uh, some people would probably find a little bit surprising. But uh, for me, it's uh, that those of I lead or have led are happy and they are achieving everything they want to achieve. So not necessarily, even though I'm very proud when I hear that people I've worked with have moved on to bigger and better things, if that's a measure. Uh, but likewise, I'm equally happy with those that uh, are doing well and in their roles and their working life, and they're really happy. So that makes me uh, you know, pretty chuffed. Um, I also said to people that I am not doing my job if anyone in my team who reports to me is not ready at a moment's notice to do my job. That's oh, nice. wow. Okay. Mm. Yeah, and that that's something that I haven't heard mentioned yeah. yet. This this idea of um, uh, uh, progression of staff, but almost like it, um, preparing yourself for the next role. Because I had one manager in my travels when I, when I first started working, and my first real job was in Canberra many many years ago, and uh, I was told by the the more I guess um, world worldly wise leaders that. You take on roles like CEO, some of them would write what their resignation letter might look like and put it in their desk for use in three or four years' time. And um, some of them said, these are what I'm going to measure success against. And one of them did mention my, my capacity as a leader to um, upskill my team to take my job because you're not going to be in a job forever. And um, that, that, that issue of, of passing the baton on, uh, seems to be important. Yeah. I think the, the other second part of what I need to say, though, when measuring success is that a leader, by virtue of their position, is in that position because they've got a job to do. So you have to have a measure of success related to the task. You know, yep. if you're in a leadership position to achieve X, Y, Z, you're going to measure X, Y, Z. Um, ultimately, that's what you're in a leadership position for, isn't it? So, yes, yeah, you've, I've got those soft measures, if you like, uh, which are important to me, um, and I've also got a, a bit of a bias towards achieving a goal. And, you know, the leader's task then is to generate everyone's interest and enthusiasm and expertise that they bring uh, to contribute to that, that outcome of the task. Brilliant. Okay, so a couple of statements for you, John, just to get your Ooh, yes. views on. Um, so on on the job experience develops better leaders. Mm, yeah, I, I I tend to agree with that. I, I don't think there's any substitute for experience. Um, you know, you practice leadership. <laughs> I think that's what you've got to do. And yeah, some of those I mentioned had the importance of of character, and you know, part of that is about how you communicate and you know, what works, what fails. And you get that from on the job. The other thing about on the job is that I think as human beings, we always look at those around us, um, you know, who hasn't been at a cafe and people watched. Uh, but it's more than that when you're in the workplace. You get, <laughs> you get the benefit of um, saying, wow, this, this person's a good leader or that person's not a good leader. And then you have to say, why? You know, why are they not a good leader in your eyes? And you, you, you're learning from that. So... I think that's important. I, I um, was in a role once when I was in the army, um, and it was an important role because it had the accountability for the transition from the recruitment function uh, for soldiers uh, to training. And we were losing 
you know, an upwards of 20% of those recruits in the first 48 hours. And I couldn't oh, understand, I couldn't understand why. And of course, I was being told that everything's all rosy and everything works smoothly. Anyway, I just gave up with despair. So I actually enlisted. I changed my name. I decided I became Mr. White. Um, and I went through the whole process. And then I learned why we were losing so many people. Well, certainly a big contributor to it, and I was able to then make some changes uh, so that the first impression someone has joining the army is, is something of a positive impression, not a negative. And uh, that, I'm pleased to say, oh, let me think, 16 years after the fact, is still in place because uh, my youngest son just recently went through that procedure and I was really pleased that uh, he had a, a professional experience in those 40, 40, first 48 hours. So um, that gives you an idea, I think, about the uh, OJT and also being in the workplace, you can, you can learn a lot. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so the next statement is formal education helps to develop better leaders. Uh, yeah, I tend to agree with that as well. I, I think it definitely helps, particularly group learning, um, where you're learning from peers or others. Um, it can really help you, uh, take you out of the, the work environment into a learning environment to test things, uh, discuss things, uh, reflect on things. Uh, I, again, if I look at my military, uh, did 25 years. Of the 25 years, I would have sent seven of those years on professional military education, to give you an idea. Wow. So okay. when you think yep. of an organisation that invests in its people, compare that to how many weeks of professional education I've done, personal education I've done since my time uh, post-military, which is going on now uh, 16 years. It's uh, measured in weeks, not uh, years. So that's uh, giving right. an idea why I think that there's a lot to be gained from uh, formal education. And I encourage everybody who's uh, in a role that can influence that to, to do so, because you, you really can get some benefit out of it, I think. OK, here's, here's another one, not out of left field, because I'm sure you've heard this before, but What's your views on the following state, or your view on the following statement? Leaders are born, not made. Oh, well, I'm afraid <laughs> the other people you've interviewed, but uh, uh, for me, um, I'm afraid I think they they are made. Um, you're probably speaking to the wrong person on this question because um, having been the leader of uh, one of Australia's most preeminent uh, leadership academies. Um, I can quite confidently say uh, that uh, leaders uh, can be made and they're more likely to be made than they are born. Now, saying that, I think we need some pretty critical ingredients. Um, and they are, uh, I guess they're all related to character, which is not surprising because it comes back to my point about leadership, and that is uh, commitment. You need a decent set of values. You've got to be self-aware and you've got to be selfless um, and uh, reflecting on those things. If you've got any or all of those things, um, I believe that uh, you can be shaped um, in to be a very good leader. And um, after nearly, what, 35, 40 years in the workforce now, that uh, I think that still holds true. Um, but it takes effort. It, it takes um, you know, technique. It takes uh, a, a lot of a reflection and thinking and support and nurturing and all those things to, to make people a leader. Um, but it, it can be done, but they've got to have that those assets in the first place, the ingredients there. If someone's not motivated to be a leader, I don't believe necessarily you're going to grow them and shape them into being one. Now, going back to the point about are they born, um, you know, you'd have to argue that some of the great leaders that we've seen through history, uh, not just through the, the parallels of the military, but other, other forms of leadership 
uh, maybe they are born. Uh, there's some there that I just don't know enough about, but um, through the social sciences, uh, the science, um, astrology, um, all the human endeavours that have gone on, great leaders. Now, perhaps they haven't been shaped in the same way I've described, uh, so are they born? That's an argument you'd have to have, but I just don't know enough detail and I haven't studied it. But I'm a big proponent of shaping people and making people leaders who want to be leaders. Yeah, no, it, it sounds like it. And again, this is why I was looking forward to this conversation. Um, I, I personally, um, and I don't think I've said this on the podcast yet, I'm still on the fence a bit. Uh, maybe it's my naivete or because I, I haven't had the amount of experience that others have had um, in their in their pathways to lead people and lead groups and so on. Um, yeah, I think it's for me, it's a 50-50 thing. Um, there are some people I've met that when I've asked them, what, you know, what's your formal training or what did you do before you became a leader? And they'll tell me I'd never had a formal day's training in my life. I had a, I had a goal, I had something I wanted to do and I just got in and did it. And, but those four things that you mentioned, they probably had those in spades and just went for something they were passionate about. And that, this is, this is now, this is where I'll get in trouble with my supervisor and or academics. But I think there's, there's that, that black box where you've got all those ingredients in can make for really powerful leaders, but they can also make for dysfunctional leaders as well. If you don't have some other tools in that toolkit. And I think, that comes over time. It, it, for me, it can't just be given to you and suddenly you're a great leader. Um, and uh, that's only a personal view. Um, I'm sure I'll be taking the task on that, but um, mm. that's why that's why people do research and you can ask that question. And yep. sort of segueing segueing into the next question, John. Um, mm. at, at the moment, I'm what what I'm calling a early career researcher around this thing called leadership, and it really does interest me. And one of the things that I'm doing in my thesis is, is based on the literature that I've read, is that the two key capabilities of leaders into the future will be strategic thinking and foresight. I've asked this question of everyone so far. What, what are your views on those as being core leader capabilities going forward? Uh I think they're important attributes, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily say most critical. Uh, the reason I say that is you can okay. have the best, you can, you can have the best uh, vision or foresight, but if you can't communicate it or put it into action, it's pretty meaningless. Um, and what I'm saying there, to be bluntly, I think from time to time we see, see too much emphasis on um, you know, slogans and noise, and there's not enough tangible doing. So I think we've got to be cautious around that. There's a lot of people say, oh, great foresight and great vision and all that sort of stuff. Um, but if they've got it bottled up in their own mind and they can't effectively communicate it, the enabling forces, the things that can bring that vision into fruition is, is, is meaningless. So I think that uh, we've got to balance those two things together. So, yes, I think critically important, but most important or most critical, I'm not so sure. Okay, no, that's great. Um, and so the final question, John, so what what might you say to a younger version like of... I feel like I'm doing an exam. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 this, this is... Uh, uh, this has been really good, and it is based on your experience. So it, there's mm. there's nothing, there is no right and wrong here. Um, so ba based on your experiences, there can't be because this everyone everyone's pathway is different. Yeah, yeah, um, what would you say to a younger version of yourself um, about being an effective leader? Well, I probably feel sorry for them. Firstly, um, what would I say? <laughs> um, have a go. Um, have a go. Don't leave anything in the tank. You know, you know, don't don't die of wondering, Eric. Don't ever die of wondering. Um, but in terms of what advice I'd give them, wow. Uh, I think three things there. Uh, one is that I believe we got too much emphasis today's world on telling and not enough time on listening. 
Um, I think we've got to make sure people listen effectively. Uh, next to that, I'd say um, think uh, before you leap, um, if you can, and always reflect on experience that leads to intuitive decision making. But I'm also of a view uh, that I'd give a younger version of me a, uh, an opportunity to think a little bit more, perhaps think a little bit more deeply about some things. And um, thirdly, and arguably most importantly, uh, effective communication. I'm just so... Uh, I don't want to be seen as Neanderthal or anything like that, but I, I do think that technology is harming uh, people's ability to effectively communicate. Um, I don't know if any of the other people you've interviewed have said the same thing, but I am getting a little bit tired of um, people hiding behind electronic means of communication and various means of communication rather than their personal uh, communication. Um, communicating personally yeah. is very powerful. Yeah. Um, we tend to uh, lose that a little bit, I think, and uh, you've got to be seen. Um, so I'd give him that advice probably. And finally, I'd probably say that the people that you are leading won't give a damn about what you know until you actually show those people that you are leading that you care. Wow, okay. Um, I, have, I have so many questions there, but I'm not, I'm not going to keep you on forever. I, I do have one, though, one that... That last one is very clear said. because I think it's important because today we put a lot of emphasis on knowledge. Uh, we uh, you know, tend to bring teams together, bias with their knowledge, uh, bias necessary their experience or their character. And I think we've got to be careful because when it ultimately comes to the test of a leader getting the job done, the followers are more inclined to do so if they respect the leader if they understand the leader's values and what he or she stands for. And you only can do that if you can actually demonstrate that you care about those that are following you. Um, without doing that, I, I reckon we, we're missing the human element and that worries me. Okay. Okay. John, look, I'm, thank you for your time. For those that are listening to the podcast, that was um, John Black. I'm, I really... Um, I could have carried on with this for a long time, but I, I, I don't want to keep you on forever, John. Um, <laughs> I will right. ask a favour though that uh, yep. in, into the into the future, I've got I do have other questions, and I, I want to keep going on with the podcast series. So if if you're around and we, we can catch up again, that would be great. Uh, um, I, I I encourage everyone to listen to this podcast. There are some nuggets of wisdom here that that um, I hadn't really given a lot of thought to, but um, now that you've actually said them out loud, mate, I think one of the reasons why, and you'll find this in your, your past dealings, that people have enjoyed working with you because you allow pe people to um, be their best selves in those jobs, and you can't get that if you're micromanaging people. And I do remember one of, because the job that I had w with you that I mentioned at the start of the podcast, uh, there were times where you just let me go and do my thing and there was no hand-holding. It was, yep, you, you can do this, just go and do it. That can sometimes be very disconcerting because it's what employees want, but when it's given to them, sometimes you think, oh, shit, I've got to actually do something now as opposed to hoping that there'll be somebody there going, no, this is the actual way you've got to go. So um, that that aspect of leadership is, is only something you can get with experience. So uh, from... Uh, if I had to go back and, and talk to a younger version of myself, I would be saying the exact same things you've said. And one of the other podcasts that I did with um, a gentleman by the name of uh, Artie Raptus um, said to me, you have to be your authentic self when you're talking to people. And I think um, employees of whatever 
skill level or life experience can pick up BS quite quickly. And if they don't trust you and they don't think you're being genuine, you've lost your people. Is that, yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, is that Mr. Seafood Raptors? Yeah, yeah. Artie Raptors, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I agree. And that's why it comes up to that point about communication because um, that authenticity is going to come through, you know, eyeballing someone, not through an email, not through an SMS, not through Facebook, uh, but genuine human interaction. Um, and that's it is. I, I, the Australian soldier, in my view, the Australian soldier's got by far the most finely tuned bullshit meter known to man. <laughs> and uh, I might say that the day that uh, the Australian soldier doesn't reflect our society worries me, and I'm pleased to say that uh, people I've led outside of the military in Australia are the same, which is good. Um, you know, Aussies like to question things, uh, they, they like to query it, they, they're suspicious of leaders, generally, and uh, that's a good thing. Thanks, John. That was John Black, and I'd like to thank everyone for following this podcast. I'll uh, catch up with you next time.